Dean Honey and her guests. Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. Thank you very much for joining us. We have a very interesting panel where we will discuss the impact of technological transformations on businesses and specifically on industry. We have with us uh, an esteemed panel. Let me introduce our speakers. On my left side here is Mr. Yusuf El Benyan, Vice Chairman and CEO of SABIC of, the, of KSA of Saudi Arabia. Also with us is Dr. Klaus Kleinfeld, advisor to His Royal Highness and the chairman of NAOM's founding board and a member of the founding board. On my right side here is Mr. Lorenzo Simonelli. He is the CEO of Baker Hughes GE of the USA. And next to him is Mr. Carl Ma, vice chairman of TUS Holding from China. We are still waiting for uh, Mr. Badr al Alama. If he joins us, then we will uh, also include him in the conversation. So let us start our discussion now. Unprecedented technological innovations such as artificial intelligence and machine learning, human-machine interactions and IoT continue to connect the physical, digital and biological worlds. So how can CEOs stay ahead of these changes to grow their companies and advance their corporate priorities? I will start with you, Mr. Lvanyan, with a flavor from the region. What do you think are the priorities for CEOs, leaders of companies in this part of the world, how urgent is it for them to embrace technological transformations and where do they start? First of all, uh, thank you Nadine. This is really a wonderful platform for SABIC and I think the all investors to participate for the second year in FII. This is a platform that really was going to fuel the business, not only in Middle East and KSA specifically, but it's going to create an opportunities for the global community. From, from a CEO perspective, I don't look at it only from the region, uh, but I look at it globally. I think transformations and technology innovation is going to be very crucial. In the same time, it's going to create the challenges that is going to be facing the business through their course of progressions. Therefore, they need to be up to speed of the transformations in this era. More importantly, they have to look at it with a different mindset is going to bring in opportunities for them not only to improve or invent, but also they have to reinvent themselves with a different business model in order for them to have a sustainable growth. Just keep in mind, if today we look at what I call the native digital companies, Uber has provided a very fantastic customer experience with a platform that really have challenged the traditional riding hail companies. We have to keep in mind just a few decades ago, if you look at the top five companies who occupy the 500 fortune companies, they're all traditionals. As of today, none of them really occupy the top five. They are all technology and, and uh, more into innovations company. So they have to keep in mind if they don't really transform themselves with a different really a platform and clear strategy with a commitment, I think uh, they will be left behind. And I don't really look at traditional incremental transformation, but has to be a complete transformation. Otherwise, they would not be able to satisfy truly their shareholders. Therefore, uh, the CEOs has to really come out of their, what I call is traditional offices, and they need to be engaged with their community internally, externally, in order for them to stay in course. Dr. Kleinfeld, you, you have a long history of running um, industrial companies. But now, do you think that the pace of technological change has changed from what it was when you were leading industrial conglomerates? Yeah, it has clearly changed, and you see it in, in multiple fronts. I mean, I think the magnitude of change uh, we have seen before. You know, when you think of a longer term uh, time span, if you think the agricultural society going into industrial society, but now going into post industrial society, you know. Uh, I looked at the data recently of the S&P 500, you know, and what, what, how, how long did companies typically stay in that? You know, and in the 50s, I mean, the companies stayed in this for, for more than 40, 50 years, you know. Now it's down to five, to four or five years, you know. When you look at 
just recently was reminded, you know, by uh, when you get a little older, you think, when was it that the internet really started? And in 1997, I looked, the, the internet uh, reached 1% of the world's population, you know, and if you look at it like today, and I looked at my children a really long time ago, and when we go to places where they can't get an internet already when they were young, you know. They cannot survive. They, 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 <laughs> they, 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 they think that they, they think you're doing something insane to them, you know, because they believe it's somewhere in the air and it, it's everywhere, you know. So it's clear, it's very, very clear that, that technological change is, is, is gaining speed, you know, and it's pretty dramatic, you know. But the phenomenon of dramatic change has been around, and I think the generation that's in it always overestimates it. And the good thing in my view is, I mean, I'm, I, I'm uh, by nature a realistic optimist, you know, and one thing that gives me a great comfort is that the human, one of the ingenuities of humankind is that we are very capable of adjusting, you know. And uh, but when you go through, I mean, how have people lived in the agricultural age? And what have they seen when the industrial age came on? When you read these stories, how worried they were. And in the end, it all worked out fine. And in fact, it has brought great achievements to us. And we wouldn't be sitting here in this age, to be honest, be this healthy, you know, if it hadn't been for the great improvements that science has brought. You know? um, let us talk a little bit more industry specific, Mr. Simonelli. Let us talk about the shifts that uh, are happening in the oil and gas industry. Yes, if you look at the oil and gas industry, uh, technology is very important and very much so now as we go through the energy transition and also the ecological and environmental impact that uh, our industry has. So if you look at it from a standpoint of productivity, first of all, the oil and gas industry historically is known to be very inefficient. If you look at extraction rates at best, you're looking at just above 50%. You're looking at non-productive time and so technology really helps us to drive productivity. But then you look at where the resource is as well. It's not always in the best places uh, from a perspective of a hard to reach and also the terrain to the climate. The logistical, element. logistical element that's very tough. And so you look at the changing uh, views of uh, the labor force, they actually don't want to spend time there. They don't want to be in these uh, locations. And so being able to apply technology and also use digital to enable the extraction to take place. And thirdly, when you look at also the whole aspect of the environmental, uh, there are better ways to actually have less of a carbon footprint while we're utilizing this great resource of oil and gas. So we're going through, I think, really an era where technology is critical for us to advance the industry forward. We all know we need energy. We know that oil and gas is a key role to play. Well, we've got to innovate with technology and disrupt the industry with, as we go forward. What are the successful uh, stories there? Successful stories are, first of all, by applying uh, data and being able to capture data, we can actually drive non-productive time down. So you can predict when a failure will take place. You look at remote operations. You can now actually have um, machines that are guided from a central location, even though they're thousands of miles away. And so that helps with the labor aspect. And then on the environmental footprint, measuring CO2, actually having all of the uh, aspects from sensors and metrics in place so that we know what the environmental footprint is and the carbon footprint of what we're doing from an ecological perspective. Uh, Mr. Ma, I'd like to ask you about uh, the industry in China. Um, I mean, uh, are they, uh, we would like to understand from you uh, how fast are they uh, adopting new technologies, transformational technologies, uh, and do you think they are doing what is necessary to stay ahead of the game? Uh, here, uh, it's important to mention that Tusk Holding is a shareholder in hundreds of companies, so you can give us this, uh, this uh, global, uh, this sure. idea, big idea. Sure. Uh, I think the name of Tux Holding may be new to many people in the room, but uh, we have been in the business of innovation in the past 25 years. Uh, the company is founded by Tsinghua University, which is the best engineering school in China. 25 years ago, to, uh, we service and we incubate and we help the talents to transfer the uh, technology into products and services. Uh, since then, we have been uh, growing into a 30 billion company with most of our investment into different deep tech companies, uh, into shares and also into research with the u universities. Uh, we are the biggest innovation network in the country and we also partner with 40 countries in the world, uh, including uh, the top tier academic institutions and some of the government and so on funds. Uh, 
Tsinghua University and some sovereign funds are the major shareholder of our company. So most of our capital initially came from the government side. Mm -hmm. uh, and we do investment for a very long term. Uh, we look at the investment or ideas, uh, technology ideas that's beneficial to the society and to the, com uh, to the country's stri uh, strategy in the very long run. Uh, right now, China is putting technology or technology transformation as the, as the most important uh, strategy for the country. Uh, so it's a top-down approach. It's driven by the government. It is. Uh, the government plays a very active role in the game. Uh, they are establishing the, the landscape and also the environment for the uh, technology companies to grow quickly and to adopt their ideas and technologies into products and services. And at the same time, they are also uh, pushing new regulations so that we can uh, to have better use of the technologies in China. Uh, I would say in China, uh, we have already transformed from just uh, the biggest producer of the world into a more a digital and smart city focused country right now. Uh, and there's a lot of controversy as well <laughs> related to that with IP and uh, we will maybe if we have time we will uh, go more into that but Mr. Benyana I'd like to go back to the petrochemical industry so can you tell us what are the digital transformations that are changing the petrochemical industry and that you think will drive growth going forward? Well uh, just uh, allow me uh, to take this opportunities to get our industry more visible in the platform. If you look at the evolutions in the world economy, we started what we they call it hunting era, and then we move into agricultures and then industrializations. And in the same times, if we take it to the energy sector, if you look at 19th century, it was driven by basically coal and iron. And then we move on the 20th century, and then we see oil and steel has become really the driver for the global economy. In the 21st century, I think the petrochemical industry is going to be a very important for growth and prosperity. Therefore, if you, if you look at just take uh, some numbers that can give you the importance of our industry to the global economy. By 2050, we'll have more than 9 billion people. India by itself is going to have more than 350 million moving to urban area. Mm. This is almost the size of the United States today. 65% of the 9 billion they have to live in urban cities. What does it mean? They need to have the quality of urban cities in terms of air conditioning, mobility, electronics, and healthcare, and so on. The petrochemical industry, unfortunately, is not visible as much as other industry, like the banking industry, like technology industry, and oil industry. But we are touching everybody. Everybody in our daily life, I think it touches. If you look at food industry, for example, and food security, we produce basically more yield for less field through our fertilizers. If you look at the packaging, it's making your foods fresher for a longer period of time. If you are at electronics, healthcare, cosmetics. So we are really everywhere in every individual lives in a daily. If you take technology innovations with that sense, it's going to be very crucial for our future transformations. And interestingly enough, as of today, if you touch each one of you, your mobile, it has computing power that's more stronger, trillion time, than basically what Apollo computing guiding system really helped the mankind land in the moon. If you look at, we never anticipated that we will have machines interface, and this is penetrated through devices and more sophisticated system. Advanced robotics has really penetrated the workshop floors as of today. 3D printing, which basically give you logistic, 3D in terms of design and product developments. It's no longer as an option, I think is a must. Therefore, our industry has really transformed. Transformed through a very interesting digitizations where you will have a very strong, basically fast amount of data, empowered through a computing system and it's with a very large cloud capacity capability, which will provide you with a data mining that through artificial intelligence will give you all the solutions to our industry. For our technology, is not going to be options in the within the chemical industry. Therefore, we have committed and we have seen all the major players in the petrochemical industry investing so much 
in technology transformation. And of course, SABIC is one of them in order for us to cope with, with the, the demands of the people and of course to serve the global GDP growth. Dr. Kleinfeld, if we look today at the emerging technologies, which do you think are, is the most exciting that will have the most impact on businesses but also human life, do you think? Yeah, there's a, a lot going on and you mentioned a lot of those and, and I, from my past life, could get very excited about uh, the material sciences and 3D printing and all that opens up a lot. But if I look at which one would I think has the biggest impact, I would say artificial intelligence clearly has the biggest impact on all of us, right? And, and because there's really no field, um, really no field. I mean, I originally thought there are some fields that will will not be affected by it, but I really do believe there's no field that will not be affected by it, you know, and the speed in which this is improving is, is actually very, very fast. I mean, if you look at uh, the, the, Go, the, the gentleman uh, who was defeated by, by uh, the, the Go game, you know, uh, and, and he, he made a press conference before the, the, the day before he started playing and saying it takes 10 years and then he was defeated hands down. A year later when a friend of mine met with him and had a discussion and said, well, how do you look at that? I mean, going out publicly and saying, you know what, I don't, I don't worry about this. I will beat the machine for 10 years and then get spacey pushed out. You know what he said a year later? There has not been any other game in my life than those games that I played where I've learned more about playing Go. You know, and I recently visited another friend of mine who's in the, uh, in the uh, computer aided design, and he showed me uh, showed me a, a piece that looked like a bone structure and was like a V structure, and he wanted he said, Klaus, guess what? This is 3D printed. You know, so 3D printed titanium piece, and I couldn't guess it. I, it looked like an ancient ancient bone structure, and he said it's a fork or back fork of a motorcycle. You know, and I looked at it and I said, no, this cannot be. It's wrongly designed. You know, and and he said, well, why do you think it's wrongly designed? He said because it's not symmetric. Everybody learns and learns in engineering school that the fork of a motorbike or, or, or a bicycle is symmetric, you know, but the machine basically has one algorithm and the algorithm was produce a part that has this kind of uh, strength but the lowest weight and it comes out with an asymmetric piece. Why? Because the chain is on the right side, right? And, and there's no reason to design this thing symmetrically. Anybody who would have thought about it, you know, and had not gone to engineering school and would have looked at it with, I mean, open eyes would have seen that's what shouldn't be designed symmetrically. We need a machine to open our eyes. That, in a way, is scary and very interesting, you know? It's scary because it's going to take away a lot of jobs. So my question to you is, if you have a son now who wants to decide what to study at university, what would you advise them to study? Well, I definitely think that they need to have uh, have learned one software language, you know, and and uh, and uh, because just to understand how how software gets programmed, I think you need to understand that. I think it's also good to to get an understanding how how these type of algorithms work. It's not that complicated, frankly, you know, even if you're not a math genius, you know. The second thing, by the way, to say the other two things that I not for, I mean, quantum quantum computing will also change the world. It's going to be a little later, you know, but those two combinations are pretty interesting, and then everything that's happened on the biotech and the biotech world is going to have a big impact. I hope most of it's going to be very positive on our lives, you know. So, so those are the three things that I think are going to affect every one of us. You know? uh, let's go back to the oil and gas industry. Uh, Baker Hughes GE is involved in uh, the digitalization of uh, the oil and gas industry. So can you tell us uh, what are the main um, endeavors that you are doing in that sense? Yeah, maybe just um, a few words on Baker Hughes GE because we actually seized the opportunity of looking at the industry and the inefficiencies and said, how can we go across the value chain? So from extraction all the way down to the downstream and also the petrochemical, how can we take away the silos and be able to look at it from a holistic basis, wing to wing? And that's where big data comes in. So you have a platform where now you can actually go and look at each of the critical pieces of equipment, asset performance management. That enables you to have the algorithms that detect if there's going to be an excursion taking place, which then enables you to maintain the uptime of the equipment. You can then also start to link it further. If you think about reservoir productivity, you take the elements of the reservoir and the different contents of the reservoir, and now you marry it up with how best to set up the equipment so that you can increase production at the same time. And so across digitization, what we've been able to do is actually see improvements in 
non-productive time coming down, which uh, we've got examples with Aramco as well, where you can actually, in the downstream applications, through some of the case studies, actually see improvements 2%, 3%. That may sound small, but it's hundreds of millions of dollars when you actually look at the quantity that's flowing through, all the way to also increasing the production. And we think that uh, it's not necessarily going to take away from the labor force. It's a reskilling, though, of the labor force. And that's one thing that you mentioned, the impact on the labor force. We actually see our employees excited by the opportunity to get involved in new things. Uh, but it does require a lot of reskilling, retooling, and more software algorithm writers than what you had in the field beforehand. This was a, a subject that was mentioned this morning. So how do you approach that, the reskilling of the labor? Like, is it a piecemeal approach? You, you, you uh, help them to enhance their skills, or is it a substitution? How, how does it work? So you have to look at it again from uh, the outset of where are you going to be at the end. And it's holistically a program that you have to start from the introductory level. So you go to uh, mid middle school, and then you go through university. You then take people in their current jobs and reskill them. We've got a program uh, today also where we're reskilling re our employees. And so you want to make sure that at the end you've got the pipeline. Uh, but you have to do it from the school all the way upwards. And uh, again, if you start early enough and you have a comprehensive program, uh, you'll actually find the talent available. The biggest thing is uh, making sure that we make the industry fun again from an oil and gas perspective because we've got a tarnished view out there. Uh, and again, that comes into the energy transitions where people think it's a, a dirty industry. It's far from dirty. It's actually got a lot of technology, a lot of data, and a lot of capability to enrich people's lives. Yeah, that's the historical view that, that has been there. Uh, Mr. Ma, you have the advantage of working both with universities and with the corporates. So do you think what are the major factors that will help corporates in, uh, adopt new uh, technologies? OK, uh, I will give you an example You know what was happening in China. Uh, in China, there's a program about uh, autonomous driving. But, but we want to approach this topic from another way to look at it. We want to create a system that helps the autonomous driving to become easier to, to realize. Okay, So how we do that? Uh, the government, the corporations, and also the universities are all involved in this program. Uh, because we want to base on future city designs to better accommodate autonomous driving. And we don't want to have single car autonomous driving. We, we grab uh, China Mobile, which is our five, 5G network carrier, into the picture because we are using that channel to exchange all the data between cars and between humans and cars and between the uh, car and the cars in the future. So in China, we are basically involving everyone. And we are also involving the citizens because they are the ultimate users and consumers of the technologies. In this way, uh, we also talk to the German automakers. We are open, the system is open to them. Uh, we talk all three of them, and then we also talk to Toyota. They are very interested to look at the China approach because we do it from a very top-down, very macro approach to try to solve the problem systematically rather than we just rely on you know, the sole intelligence of a single car to solve every problem that we, we face in the traffic every day. So uh, I think in this way, we probably will increase the efficiency of the technology adoption and also transformation uh, in the country. But at the same time, this system is not closed. We are open to US, we're open to Germany, and we exchange our findings and uh, we exchange what we happen, uh, what we find out in the markets because we have a very big market, okay? Every day, you know, the, if you go to Beijing, you know, even the subway and the public transport is huge, but still, every day we have to move around 30 million people mm. to the office. It's a and massive scale. Office. Yeah, it's, it's a massive, massive scale. scale. So we, we have many, many test sites that we can try different technologies and different ways to look at it. So this is one of the IoT applications that you are doing for smart cities. Yeah, it's one of the major, because in smart cities, uh, housing, uh, transportation, and also energy, uh, and the consumption, which is, uh, we, have, uh, we have a company that's doing uh, uh, big data with service together. So we are getting more of in 
every aspect of uh, smart city. Well, what you're talking about is, uh, this is actually a very interesting point, you know, because most people talk about autonomous driving uh, on the levels up to four and five. But what you're talking about is instead of having the intelligence just in the car, to connect the car because, uh, with the intelligence that's in the city, you know. So basically make the car look around the corner, you know, inform the, I mean, when you look at what happened in many other areas, you used to have signals in trains. Today you have no signal on train lines, even though the signal is there, it's electronic, you know. And the, the question is why do you need a traffic light, you know, if the car would know, yeah. you have to stop, you know, you yeah. can eliminate all of this. I think this is pr very, very smart, very, very smart. Yeah. And Dr. Kleinfeld, since you are on the uh, founding board of Neon, can you tell us what are the priorities for, uh, for setting up this city? We're, we're talking about a smart city Yes, here. yes. So well, what are the priorities? Well, first of all, Neon is so big that it's not just one city. It's, I, I don't even want to use the word city because I'm not so sure that the future life is the city life is the most attractive. If you could create a life, you know, that's more a village life, because we know that happiness and longevity is very strongly connected to sense of community. You know, it's one of the one of the strongest drivers. You know, of, of a happy, uh, long life. You know, so you want to create the sense of community. For us, I mean, the challenge is, I mean, the the, the, f the good thing is we have a greenfield situation, which you in most cases don't have. You have brownfield situation. So in greenfield, you can take a dream and turn the dream into reality. Transportation clearly is one of the drivers, even of how you design design a city. You know, uh, or design the, the the whole the whole map. Then you talk about energy. You know, energy, the, and particularly here in this in, in the kingdom where the sun is shining, you know, other than today. I don't know why, you know, so, 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 but usually it's shining for the guests that only are here today, you know. So if it's not shining, shining, the wind is blowing. So the wind is blowing, <laughs> the wind is also blowing, you know, and, and we don't even have to wait for battery technologies because we could first use it for peak power and then we could use it with, I mean, old ancient storage just like water, you know, hydro. So all of these things, I mean, energy, uh, entertainment is another one. On the healthcare side, I'm hugely excited about healthcare, We're hugely excited about what we can co continue to do do to lead a, a happy, a healthy life, you know, and there's a lot of stuff, not just on the conventional side, but also on what's called, I mean, uh, additional, uh, additional health care benefits, so hugely excited, and those are, those are things that uh, we are looking in. This is long. <laughs> I still have one minute, so Mr. You didn't tell us about Sabic, what Sabic is doing in that space, so let us uh, end on that note. Well, uh, well Sabic, uh, since uh, the startup we take technology is as really uh, a very strong competitive position for Sabic to uh, place our position in a global sense. But also we have more than 21 centers globally that has supported by more than 2,000 scientists and researchers to make sure that we have up to speed positions on our competitive environments. But if you look at digitization specifically, we have taken it as really a corporate initiatives. We are taking this through the whole supply chain of our industry, from feed stock, through productions, supply chain, uh, finance, human resource, and a complete chain in order for us really to take advantage of it. We are prepared from a change management perspective. This is going to have an influence in our organization and more importantly to our business model. I think the companies, the current corporate, they have to look at their business model is not going to be really sufficient to deal with these transformations. But uh, at the end, I uh, probably I would like to take advantage of, of this platform to take really a call to our universities and our educators and also who's really responsible for our education system. If you ask me what worries me as a CEO of future um, environments in terms of really job creations, I would say as much as the gestation is going to bring a value, is in the speed of what we see in technology innovation, they are more than the speed of our education system transformations. <laughs> and unfortunately, we as a corporate probably will be able to come up with mitigation plan to transport or reskill our resources. We have the capability, we have a good startup for our resources, but I'm not sure the total uh, populations are really equipped with the right uh, platform. And I think if we don't really start from the beginning, this is going to really create so much challenges with the youth that we need to take it as an advantage in terms of really becoming liability. It's time to rethink Thank the you. educational systems, especially the majors that they are focusing in in uh, universities of the, of the region. Um, our time is up, but it was a very interesting conversation. Thank you very much, gentlemen, and thank you for the audience for being here. Thanks a lot. Thank you.